Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're looking at a video from Discovery Science in which they discuss homology and why they think it's not evidence for evolution. This one has been on my list of videos to cover ever since it debuted, but it went up two days after I did a standalone video on homology, so I wanted to give you guys a break before I came back around to cover this topic again. And if I were as self-important as a certain other creationist who thinks his Whack and Atheist show actually has an effect on what kind of content people produce, I might be tempted to infer that their homology video was produced in response to mine. Simon Dan hasn't done any more on evolution since we whacked him back down about four times. Very good, Simon, wise man. Uh, Rachel hasn't done any more, and Seth, I haven't seen yours yet, I have to go back and look. But. Unlike him, I am willing to consider the distinct possibility that the people at the Discovery Institute probably don't watch my channel, and even if they did, it would not affect what content they produce. So anyway, on to the video. You know what? I never noticed this, but my pet bat has the same number of fingers as my pet alligator. Yep, and your pet whale, and your pet horse? Well, there's a different number when they're born, but during embryonic development, they do start out with the same number. Isn't that a quinky dink? Not really. There's no reason a horse embryo should grow five toes on each leg in the embryo, only to have two of them disappear entirely, and another two fuse with the cannon bone, leaving only one digit. So it's not a coincidence that all vertebrates have five digits during embryonic development, with the very rare exceptions such as snakes, whose embryonic leg buds stop developing a mere 24 hours into the embryo's existence, so they never develop far enough to figure out how many fingers snakes might have, but my money would be on five. This suggests that the reason all vertebrates have five digits is not because it was a good design, but rather because we all share a common ancestor, and that ancestor happened to have five digits. So evolution had to work with what it had been given when adapting different organisms for their environments. Because in evolution, making do with what you have, even if what you have isn't perfect, is better than completely eliminating something and starting from scratch. So no, not a coincidence, but the expected result of common descent. If, however, everything was designed, then I question the necessity of a horse embryo wasting energy to grow two fingers that will never see the light of day. One of the main arguments Darwin used for his theory was that of homology, these odd similarities between very different animals. Right, because there's really no reason for a whale to have a wrist, or for humans to have 26 bones and 33 joints in their feet. Stuff like this makes perfect sense if we share a common ancestor with other vertebrates, but if we were designed, it is evidence of a lazy designer. Why would they be so similar unless they were related? And this does make sense, after all, take siblings, they look pretty similar, they're closely related. Then take cousins or third uncles or former roommates. Exactly. The more closely related you are to someone, the more similar you will be to that person. This extends to the genetics as well, and is the entire basis for all kinds of genetic testing. Everything from matching a blood sample to a suspect to figuring out what a person's ethnic background is. And do you know what? This is a spoiler for when I get around to making my genetic evidence for evolution video, but the same test that tells you how closely related you are to a certain group of people is the one that tells us how closely related we are to chimpanzees. If it can't be relied upon for the relationships between the species on the tree of life, then it also can't be relied upon for the relationships between different humans. Anywho, Darwin wasn't the first one to notice this, but he did harness it as a central proof in the origin of species. It's to this day used as great evidence for evolution, but is it really? Yep, it really is. All by itself, it is decent evidence for evolution. Combine it with embryology, and it is excellent evidence for evolution. Combine those two with genetics, and we have fantastically excellent evidence for evolution. I could go on, but I would run out of adjectives before I ran out of fields of study that provide evidence for evolution that work perfectly with homology. Here's the story. Careful observers for a long time have noticed that very different creatures have very similar bits. These sorts of ideas date all the way back to Aristotle. Yep. Evolution and various aspects of it were known for thousands of years. Charles Darwin was the guy who put all the pieces together, so he gets all the credit, and while I have no intention of minimizing Darwin's contribution, he was working on a foundation of scientific knowledge and discovery that runs very deep. If we fast forward to the 1800s, anatomist Sir Richard Owen coined a term for these observations, homology. Take a look at this guy, 
He's got an arm that starts with one bone, followed by two bones, and then lots of tiny bones for the wrist and fingers and whatnot. Great for grabbing stuff and high-fiving. Whales and dogs have basically the same structure, but they're not so good at those things. You are painfully close. Yes, there is no reason for whales, dogs, and humans to all have the exact same bones, in the exact same arrangements, in their extremities. It stands to reason that we do because we share a common ancestor and evolution had to make do with the structure that our common ancestor happened to have. Also, yeah, dogs don't grab things very well, but they do give some really great high fives. Why in the world would that be the case? Before Darwin, biologists chalked this up to common design. It's like they predicted response videos and saw this coming, but it wasn't necessarily chalked up to common design. So if you look down in the corner there, they say or platonic archetype, because it wasn't necessarily common design. In Platonism, the idea is that abstract objects exist in perfect, spaceless, timeless form, and the symbols we use to represent them in the real world will always be somewhat imperfect. So the platonic circle is a perfect circle that doesn't really exist in reality, and every time we try to draw a circle, it will be slightly imperfect, no matter how close we get to the platonic ideal. With this view, the body plans would have been abstract concepts, and the real organisms that exist are trying to match the abstract platonic ideal body plan. This concept requires no designer either, so it kind of cuts your false dichotomy off at the knees. It is not either a common designer or common descent, it could also be the expression of platonic archetypes. And I imagine that anyone who holds to Platonism nowadays would suggest that evolution is the mechanism for the expression of these platonic archetypes. Though I am open to the idea that I am mistaken here. I don't really study Platonism, so I don't know. They might see it differently. Just like a painter has a particular style and reuses similar colors or themes that he likes across a lot of his work, so the thinking went, similarities in animal design pointed to a common designer. And that sounds all well and good if you don't really think about it too much, but when you organize these animals into categories based on which designs they share and which they do not, they fit into a nested hierarchy that matches exactly what is predicted by the theory of evolution. And that is using multiple lines of evidence to arrive there. Homology is just one. A few years later, along comes Darwin, and he figured that these structural similarities were important evidence for his theory of evolution. You make it sound as though he had evolution already as an idea and set out to find evidence to support it. No, that's not what happened. Homology was one of the lines of evidence that helped him develop his theory of evolution by natural selection. He didn't steal it as something that he found that could be used to support his already developed idea. It was a part of the large body of evidence that ultimately pointed toward his idea being correct. So, rather than a common designer, he instead credited common ancestry. But which is the proper explanation for these obvious similarities? Well, as already pointed out, that is a false dichotomy. It could be that a designer used evolution to design the life that we have today, that's a mixture of the two. It could be that Platonism is correct and there is no designer, but evolution drives organisms to achieve the platonic ideal of a body plan. But realistically, Platonism doesn't really make sense, and neither does common design. Directed evolution makes a bit more sense than either, but in my opinion, a god who directs evolution is an unnecessary assumption in this case, and so Occam's razor would have us do away with such a being. Which leaves us with unguided evolution, natural selection, and common descent. Interbiologist Tim Barra. Guys, 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 I've got a really good illustration. It'll totally put this question to bed. If you look at a 1953 Corvette and compare it to the latest model, only the most general resemblances are evident. But if you compare a 53 and 54 side by side and so on, the descent with modification is overwhelmingly obvious. It's a decent analogy, but I can see where you're going with this. The point that he was making is that yes, organisms that are related look very different from each other, but when looking through the fossil record you can see organisms that fit in between the two, looking more like one than the other, and when you line them up chronologically, it's similar to when you line up the corvettes. The two extreme ends are very different, but you can see how all the intermediates are related. Sure, it wasn't the best analogy because it's wide open to criticism that I'm sure you're about to bring up, that all Corvettes had common designers and the people at Chevy, but the point of the analogy is not to disprove common design, but rather to demonstrate in a way that lay people can understand how we can look at a series of fossils and determine how they are related to each other. The evidence is so solid and comprehensive that it can't be denied by reasonable people. Why don't we read that little bit in between the highlighted sentences, shall we? This is what paleoanthropologists do with fossils. 
In other words, he's not talking specifically about homology, he is talking about a series of fossils, in this case specifically all the hominid fossils that we've found since Darwin's time. Why would you bring that up in a video about homology? It is only barely relevant, and of course, as per usual, you guys are taking it completely out of context and misrepresenting it. In using this analogy, Dr. Bear actually demonstrates precisely the opposite of what he intended. What he intended to demonstrate, if you read it in context, is that humans and the other hominids whose fossils we have are related. And should you line up living specimens one after the other in a parade, it would be blatantly obvious that each one in the parade is related to its neighbors. So please, explain to me how he demonstrated with this analogy how we are not related to the other hominids. Here's why. A succession of even very similar forms doesn't demand common descent. It could, in this case it does, instead point to a common designer. These guys, the engineers at Chevy. So in an analogy that was meant to show how we are related to other hominids, you take that analogy farther than it was ever intended to go for its purposes, and then claim that this mischaracterization of the analogy demonstrates the opposite? Why are creationists always so bad at analogies? Like, I don't think Dr. Barrow was under the impression that cars were all direct descendants of each other in a reproductive fashion. It was merely an analogy to help people understand how we can determine relatedness through fossil evidence. Intelligent agents are free to reuse things however they want. Just like I use the same password, Fluffy Bunny 123 for everything I do online. Don't bother guys, I already tried it, they don't really use that password. And yes, a creative agent would be able to reuse things as many times as they care to. But the key here is that for an engineer at Chevy, the things that are reused make sense. It's the things that it is more efficient to reuse than to redesign from scratch. But the things that are reused in nature are not reused based on efficiency. Far from it. In some cases, the reuse preserves things that are rather inefficient, like the recurrent laryngeal nerve. This is a nerve that needs to go from the brain to the larynx, which is located at the top of the throat. Here is the tongue. Here is the pharynx. Open it up. And here is the larynx. Here is a nerve that allows you to speak. The evidence for a designer is incredibly weak. But before it goes to the larynx, it loops around under the aortic arch in the chest. There is no reason for this, and it's like this in all tetrapods. Usually the reply to this is that the laryngeal nerve innervates more than just the larynx, which it does, but it doesn't need to make two trips to do it. A more efficient design would be just to send a second bundle of nerves to the other stuff that the laryngeal nerve innervates, rather than sending one nerve on a round trip. No matter how you look at it, the laryngeal nerve is not an example of good design. However, when you look at our evolutionary history, it makes perfect sense. We evolved from fish-like creatures. Fish have several aortic arches that supply the gills with blood, and have a nerve that takes a direct route through these aortic arches to an area of the gills that is near the heart. If you look at our embryos, we have a very similar layout with the pharyngeal arches being homologous to what eventually turns into gills on fish, and our laryngeal nerve passes over these pharyngeal arches. We also have several aortic arches supplying this area with blood. Eventually during development it turns into one single aortic arch, which traps the laryngeal nerve underneath it. As our ancestors developed next, this detour became more and more ridiculous, but as I mentioned before, evolution cannot backtrack and redesign something that would work better, it has to make do with what it has. And it had a laryngeal nerve that was trapped under the aortic arch. This is when everyone expects me to bring up the giraffe's 5 meter laryngeal nerve, which is absolutely ridiculous, but the giraffe's nerve is tiny in comparison to what a sauropod's laryngeal nerve would have been, which, depending on the species, could have been upwards of 28 meters long. And that's just looking at things that got reused that are still functional. What about our gene for producing vitamin C? We have that. It's in our genetic code. In most animals, it makes vitamin C so they don't have to eat it. Why do we have a defunct gene that could have been useful, especially before refrigeration made it relatively easy to get a regular supply of foods high in vitamin C? To continue on with the Corvette analogy, that would be like the engineers deciding to make an all-electric Corvette, but keeping the gas tank. Would anyone look at that and declare it to be good design? And we have vestiges all over our bodies of things that used to have one function but now have another, or used to have any function but now have none, or still have a bit of a function but are fading away. Not to mention ones whose existence does nothing but cause pain, like wisdom teeth. People who have their wisdom teeth removed do just fine without them, and people who don't get them removed can often have severe problems with them. Why were we designed with too many teeth for our skull? 
Was the designer just being lazy when he copied the larger skull of the other great apes? Or could it be that we are great apes whose skulls have shrunk and wisdom teeth are just a remnant of a time when we actually had room for them? So the question remains open, is homology due to common design or common descent? The question only really remains open if you are willing to admit that your designer is sloppy and lazy, because we are really not very well designed at all. Because the argument was so central to Darwin's case, his followers eliminated the question by simply redefining the word from simple similarity to meaning similarity due to common ancestry. Are you serious? Really? A definition is not in and of itself evidence of anything. A definition is just an explanation of how the word is being used and what people mean when they use it. They bake Darwinism into the definition of the word. Homology now typically means similarity due to common ancestry. It's a clever way to end an argument if you can get away with it, but for anybody paying attention, it's a baldly circular one. Common ancestry because common ancestry. We gotta flag all the play, circular reasoning, illegal use of logic, five yard penalty, repeat the fourth grade. Do you guys know that definitions are not arguments? Why are you acting as though the definition is a logical syllogism? So let me say it again. A definition is not an argument. It is not meant to be an argument. Never was. Now, feel free to disagree with the definition, but since the overwhelming scientific consensus is that evolution is a fact, when evolutionary biologists use the word homology, they are using the word to mean a similarity that is due to common ancestry. That's all this means. They are not attempting to prove evolution by defining terms in evolutionary biology with the assumption that evolution is true. The way that it's being looked at is that evolution is true, so when speaking about certain aspects of evolution, we're referencing evolution. This would be like getting upset that the definition of heartburn includes the assumption that it's caused by the presence of acid in the esophagus. It is generally accepted that heartburn is, in fact, caused by the presence of acid in the esophagus, so to speak in such terms while defining heartburn is perfectly acceptable and would, in fact, be weird if we defined heartburn in a way that avoided reference to acid in the esophagus. In scientific circles, it is the overwhelming consensus that evolution happens. So when two structures are similar because of an evolutionary relationship, it is perfectly acceptable to include this fact in the definition of the word that we use to describe two structures that are similar because of their evolutionary relationship. And, as a bonus, this helps us distinguish between structures that appear similar but do not share an evolutionary relationship, like the tympanic membranes of birds and mammals. They are very similar, but they are not homologous because our common ancestor with birds did not have a tympanic membrane. Maybe the confusion comes in when people refer to homology as evidence for evolution. I myself have done that in this very video nonetheless. But it's not that something is assumed to be homologous, and because homology implies evolution, evolution must be true. No, before something can be safely called homologous, it needs to first be demonstrated to be the result of common ancestry. Once this is done, we call it homologous, and the evidence that it is homologous is necessarily evidence for common ancestry, because homologous is just the word we use to describe something once it has enough evidence to say that it is a result of common ancestry. It is much easier to say these two features are homologous than to say these two features developed from a basal form of these features that was present in their common ancestor. Oh come on, no serious biologist could possibly make that mistake. Nobody defines homology that way and then uses it as evidence for evolution. Correct. Nobody defines it that way and then uses the definition as evidence for evolution. And you're referencing a Talk Origins page there, so let's take a look at that and see what we find. It's a short one, so let's just read the whole thing. Homology is not defined as similarity due to common ancestry and then used as evidence for common ancestry. Rather, the evidence for common ancestry comes from the patterns of similarity of many traits. These similarities show that organisms group naturally into a nested hierarchy. For example, that ladybugs and scarabs are both types of beetle is based on various common traits such as the hardened front wings. Beetles, flies, and grasshoppers are types of insects. Insects, scorpions, and centipedes are types of arthropod. Such grouping does not depend on any assumptions about origins, and in fact was first codified by Linnaeus, a creationist. A grouping suggested by many common traits is evidence of common ancestry. This is true no matter what you choose to call the traits. The homology label gets added after the evidence for common ancestry is already in. So the thing with homology is that the structures are not explained as being homologous until we have good evidence to support the idea that the homologous structures did originate in the common ancestor of the organisms that we are comparing. 
So homology is not evidence for evolution because we baked evolution into the definition of homology. Rather, the evidence for homology is also evidence for evolution because of the implications of the evidence for homology. Come on, people couldn't possibly be that dumb. The circular argumentation is still regularly used in high school, even college level textbooks, and many a YouTube video. The surprising thing is that many otherwise very smart people didn't realize this. Yeah, that would be surprising. Could it maybe be that rather than the millions of really intelligent biologists over the past century not noticing this glaring error, that it is you who are mistaken? Maybe you've misunderstood what is meant by homology. Maybe you don't understand that a definition is not and never has been meant as evidence. Nah, you guys must be right and the millions of biologists must have missed this very basic problem. However, more and more people are seeing the problem for what it is. More and more people are seeing the problem for what it is, he says, while displaying two publications. One from 1985 and the other from 1947. I understand why creationists usually rely on old research, but do they have to blatantly present it as if it is groundbreaking new material that's in the process of shifting the scientific consensus? I'm having a hard time finding any recent publications on the matter, and since homology is still being defined in terms of common ancestry, I am under the impression that this means that these two publications were mistaken. I mean, I skimmed through them. The 1947 paper reads as though it were published in the middle of the debate as to whether or not homology should include common ancestry in the definition, and the passage that you have highlighted makes it rather obvious that they were writing this before the development of techniques that are used today of relatively quick and easy genome analysis. As for the 1985 one, it reads like someone who is a holdout on the earlier agreement that common ancestry should be included in the scientific definition. And maybe I'm just speaking with the benefit of the last 35 years of scientific discovery, but he seems to be unaware of several of the lines of evidence that are used to determine if structures are similar due to common descent, or if they are similar due to other reasons. My point is, to find scientists who agree with your position, you had to go back in time 35 years for one, and 73 years for the other. So what are the options in trying to solve this problem and escape the vicious circularity? To examine all the evidence for common descent and determine whether common descent is actually the reason for the similarity before declaring it to be homologous? Seems pretty simple to me. Seeing their success at redefining homology, some try to redefine circular reasoning too. Huh, all right, let's, let's see here. Whoa, 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 it's not circular reasoning. Let's call it uh, reciprocal illumination. Reciprocal illumination is not circular reasoning. It's a term that is used across many different areas of study to mean generally the same thing. I found one paper in the Journal of Medical Education talking about how the educational process should be a process of reciprocal illumination. That is, education works best when the students learn from the teacher, and the teacher learns from the student. Reciprocal illumination can also be applied to a scenario where people are having a disagreement, and they both come to a sudden realization that they're talking past each other, and this realization allows them to resolve their dispute. In the sciences, it's often a matter of two different scientific disciplines causing advances in each other. So, for instance, paleontology and molecular biology have both contributed to each other when it comes to finding an organism's placement on the tree of life. And that, I think, is the type of reciprocal illumination being spoken of here. A study of the fossils indicates homology, but other methods might point toward analogy. The idea here is to look at the whole of the data to see what picture all the data together paints, rather than looking at one field in isolation. Fancying up a term doesn't really change the argument. Nope, it doesn't. Good thing reciprocal illumination doesn't actually refer to circular reasoning. Other attempts were made to escape the circularity, but they had to give up on homology as evidence. Do you see the sentence that comes right after the colon there? Common ancestry is inferred based on many sources of information and reinforced by the patterns of similarity and dissimilarity of anatomical structures. Or how about the two sentences before your highlighted area? Homology of structures across species is not assumed but tested by the repeated comparison of numerous features that do or do not sort into successive clusters. Homology is used to test hypotheses of degrees of relatedness. In other words, the definition of homology is not itself evidence of common ancestry, but the study of homology is made possible by the fact of common ancestry. Like, that paragraph is literally the NCSE's answer to the question, why do textbooks define homology as similarity due to common ancestry, then claim that it is evidence for common ancestry, a circular argument masquerading as scientific evidence. And instead, they look to other lines of evidence for common ancestry, namely 
DNA. Oh, so you did read past that sentence. Yes, DNA is one of the other lines of evidence for common ancestry. Eyeballing bones is a bit subjective anyway. It's kind of like trying to guess what someone's thinking by looking at their face. Did you really just dismiss the entire field of paleontology by claiming it to just be subjective? Really? An entire branch of science just poof, gone. It's too subjective. Never mind the science journal called paleontology. Studying bones is like figuring out someone's thoughts by looking at their faces. Ignore it. Forget it. No. This is where the reciprocal illumination thing comes in. Paleontologists can figure out relatedness based on similarities and timing in the fossil record. Geneticists can then use paleontological data to figure out when the common ancestor of currently extant species existed and get a picture of what they looked like. Paleontologists can then use this genetic data to narrow down their hypotheses of relatedness. Both fields help make advances in the other in a type of reciprocation that is quite illuminating. Maybe there should be a term to describe this phenomenon. Oh wait, there is, and you equated it with circular reasoning right before you dismissed all of paleontology. This one's getting a bit lengthy, and this is where they go through an abrupt topic shift from homology to cytochrome C and cytochrome B phylogenies. So I'll save all that for a future part two. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Jamie Russell, who says, One tenth of one percent? Sounds like a theory based on the missing missing links. Fossils promote evolution, we just don't have enough to show it. This was posted on my video on how the fossil record is evidence for evolution, where I mentioned that it is estimated that only one-tenth of one percent of species to ever exist are actually represented in the fossil record. I think Jamie might have missed the point. The point was that it is amazing how much evidence for evolution is in the fossil record when it is entirely possible, with how rare an event fossilization is, that not one single transitional lineage would be well represented. But we have several. And yes, they are incomplete. There were probably thousands of individual species that we have no record for in between Pachycetus and Ambulocetus, but they are close enough that we can tell they are related. Extra special thanks today for the PayPal donations from Ann Ka and Mike Mitchell. They were both very much appreciated. And thanks as always to my patrons, who are the boilers that keep the hot water that is my channel flowing. If you'd like to keep me warm and moist, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash vicerhino. And also, you know, merch store, Twitter, Facebook, P.O. Box, the usual. See you next time. <laughs>